a man. Built mostly during the second part of the 20th century, the modern city is the capital of the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan and thus reflects the long and rich history of the country. The origins of Amman date back to biblical times, when its name was Rabbath Ammon. Initially a city-state of the Ammonite Kingdom, then renamed Philadelphia by the successors of Alexander the Great. It came under Roman control and joined the vast trading network known as the Decapolis. The impressive theater built by Emperor Marcus Aurelius remains from that era. The name of the city would only become Amman after the Arab conquest in 635. Born of the breakup of the European colonial empires following World War I, the young state found itself in the heart of a region that very early on was the stage of events of historical magnitude. As a long hidden gem of the Middle East and a meeting point between Africa, Europe and Asia, this part of the world had always been highly coveted. From Hebrews to Jews to Christians to Umayyads, Mamluks, Abbasids, Ottomans, and more recently, British and Palestinians, all have treaded upon this land without ever being able to conquer it for good. It would seem, however, that one people never truly conceded its sovereignty, the Bedouins. As nomads living off pastoralism, these sons of the desert remain the guardians of age-old traditions. Pillars of the current kingdom, they still live Badawi style, in other words, following the Bedouin ways of their ancestors. But who were these ancestors? The mystery remains. Some claim that they descended from an ancient nomadic people that settled in the middle of this rocky setting in the 4th century BC by founding Petra, their capital. They were called the Nabataeans. <laughs> If Jordan now welcomes several million tourists every year, it is mostly due to the rediscovery of Petra in the 19th century. Without a doubt, the former Nabataean capital represents Jordan's most illustrious historical site and the most impressive of all the Middle East. Sculpted in the very rock, this city from a bygone era never ceases to amaze the visitors and to whet the appetite of the archaeologists. Numerous research teams from all over the world come every year and contribute their work towards the broadening of general knowledge about the Nabataeans. Among others, a Jordanian team recently made an astonishing discovery on the site of al Kazne popularized by the third installment of the Indiana Jones franchise. Beneath his temple, the archaeologists found the entrance to an imperial tomb that dates back to the first century BC.
The discovery is proof that at that time, the level of this part of the city was several feet below the current level, causing to reassess the true face of the Nabataean city. <laughs> These new clues found inside of the building came to complete the huge puzzle represented by the history of the Nabataeans. The analysis of the ceramic artifacts notably allowed to clarify the dating and to identify the various cultural phases of this society. What were the origins of this nomadic people? How did it settle to become one of the most powerful civilizations of the ancient world? Classic tradition has it that the Nabataeans were descendants of Ishmael. Upon arriving from the Arabian Peninsula, they settled in successive waves in the land of Edom in the 6th century BC. If they were still there today, they'd be called desert millionaires. As master caravan travelers, the Nabataeans transported precious goods from India, China, the Kingdom of Sheba, Aqaba, and Palmyra. This included silk, cotton, horses, copper and iron, dyes, pearls and ivory, pepper, cinnamon, and of course, incense and myrrh. The Nabataeans also exploited slaves that they sold to the Egyptians, to the Greeks, and later to the Romans. According to the account of Diodorus Sicilus, a Greek historian from the first century BC, the Nabataeans lived under tents and their customs forbade them from sowing seeds, planting fruit trees, drinking wine, or building houses. Any infringement of these rules would be sanctioned by the death penalty. The foundations of nomadism were born. Made more flexible over time, these living precepts continued to be perpetuated by the few thousand Bedouin families that still live in the desert. We own a concrete house in Wadi Rum, but we Bedouins always prefer to live under a tent. That way, the goats and camels can roam around and search for food in the desert. Our tents are made of wool, which stretches in the summer because of the heat and firms up again in the winter cold. When it rains, the fibers also retract, which allows the water to flow on each side. We're a family of nine. We own a herd of about 30 goats and four camels, among which one baby. We live between here and the village because the desert doesn't always offer the vegetation that's necessary for the cattle. We sell the produce from our farming in exchange for supplies that we buy in the village. In the spring, after the rainy season, if any, the desert features thicker vegetation. We then move from one place to the next. We travel between two and three miles, and after this migration, we go back to the village, for there's always water there.
ننتقل لمحل ثاني يعني بنروح حول ثلاثة كيلي أربعة كيلي إلى ما ينتهي وبعدين نعود نرجع هون قرب المي. Water is the key. Without it, the caravan traffic that dominated the life of the ancient nomads would not have been possible. Crossing the ochre furnace of these arid regions for extended periods of time required perfect knowledge of the natural resources and to master any and all water techniques. Such journeys also meant to know the natural shelters that punctuated the trails, as the latter were anything but safe. Greeks and Romans would often attack the convoys for their cargo and water alike, and women, elderly people and children often had to pay the ultimate price. That's why, in spite of their religious constraints, the Nabataeans settled on this rocky stage. Their goal was first and foremost to ensure their own safety by creating a place where they could hide and store their goods. Second, they would offer this safety to transient visitors in exchange for a toll. And third, they could control the caravan traffic. Located at the intersection of the major trade routes, the choice of Petra was all the more judicious as it represented the last vital rest stop before the uncertainty of the desert. In fact, the founders of Petra held the secrets of water harnessing, retention, and above all, distribution. Their inventions with that regard are still clearly visible. The Nabataeans were ingenious, particularly with their water systems. Underlying this whole temple precinct are massive water systems, canalization systems, that are bringing water in as well as taking water out. And these are water systems that we find in the Seek, that are carried through Petra, they manage to bring the water around Hoopta Mountain and into the city by different routes. We have a spring to the southwest of the temple and that, in combination with the Sikh water and the Wadi Musa, provided these people, who numbered supposedly 30,000 at the height, with enough water, to, which seems really quite uh, amazing when you see how arid the area is today. Comfortably settled and perfectly well organized, these sand princes built themselves a true kingdom in a matter of a few centuries. Granted, this kingdom was small, but it was powerful and respected. It was all the more respected as Nabatea frequently entered into non-aggression agreements with most of the other regional societies as a way to maintain its long-term trade relations. The Nabataeans became so powerful that they treated themselves to rich dwellings with particularly elaborate decorations. The brand new craftsmanship of the ornamental repertoire highlights various influences. Did the Nabataeans import ideas from other areas, other major capitals of the world? Absolutely, they were nomads. They had to show that they had uh, gained great prosperity and they had to copy all the great cities of the ancient world like Antioch and uh, Alexandria. And it's probably from Alexandria that they imported craftsmen 
who with great mastery trained the locals how to carve the elements that you see today in Petra. We have Assyrian motifs, we have Egyptian motifs, we have Hellenistic motifs. All of these are ideas that they decided to make as part of their canon and then they then imposed their own indigenous quality upon them. That's how the Nabataeans, these seasoned nomads, became builders. They cut their public edifices, houses, temples and tombs directly out of the rock. They even sculpted a theater. But the pink city would only shine until 106 AD, when the Nabataean kingdom was annexed by the Roman Empire to constitute the Roman province of Arabia, with Bosra as a new capital. While Petra gradually lost its clout, the Nabataean civilization didn't actually cease to exist. It's only on the eve of May 19, 363, that a natural disaster sounded the death knell of the Nabataean kingdom once and for all. From then on, Petra and its region fell into an oblivion that would last several centuries, before being rediscovered in 1812 by Burkhard, a Western spy explorer. In spite of its Greco-Roman influences, the Nabataean civilization never lost its identity. Nowadays, it's an important reference in the Arab world with regard to the origins of its identity. But can we claim that the Bedouins and the Jordanians themselves are direct descendants of the Nabataeans? The question may seem contradictory, but it's based on an established historical element. Several Roman scribes, and especially Herodotus, the father of history, mentioned in writing that the Nabataeans came from Bedouin tribes. Some researchers, and most recently Dr. Khalil Nami, a renowned Egyptian expert, wrote an article where they connect the Nabataeans to the Badouls, the Jordanian tribes. The Badouls are semi-sedentary nomads who occupy the site of Petra in the 19th century using the ancient installations. In the 1970s, a large number of Badul families were still residing there. Given the growing number of children, the Wadi Musa Primary School was created and a teacher was appointed. Simultaneously, another phenomenon developed, tourism. It was a gift from above for the residents of Petra. Up from the theater, going up to the Among them, Shaher, who was still a teenager at the time. I was born here, in this cave. My mother gave birth to me in this very spot all these years ago. This is where we lived with my five brothers, four sisters, my father, and my mother. As far as school was concerned, I used to leave home at six in the morning. I walked from here all the way to Wadi Musa.
The school would open its doors at eight, and we used to get there by way of the Sikh. Same thing to get home from school. We walked six miles a day, three miles there and three miles back. After school, we would play soccer. I would ride donkeys or camels. We used to climb the mountains, run, or go to the water streams to get a drink. I remember, I used to climb these rocks and stare at the mountains that stretched completely empty as far as the eye could see. Petra felt like mine, and I was happy. In 1985, the Jordanian state, in agreement with UNESCO, decided to move the Badouls, who would have to live in a village specifically built for them on the edge of the site. Unknowingly, the Nabataeans left behind a capital and its facilities that would continue to be used until this day. By adopting their lifestyle, the Bedouins were thus a real vector of cultural transmission. But this pattern of continuity does not limit itself to lifestyles. It also pertains to the ways of thinking and notably to the will to live in harmony with the outside world. I believe the Nabataeans played the initial founding role of what is now modern Jordan. Jordan can be looked upon as the true descendant of the Nabataean kingdom, in the sense that it's open towards Arabia, towards Mesopotamia, Syria and Egypt. That was a feature of the Nabataeans, this openness to the neighboring countries and above all to the Mediterranean through the city of Gaza. Through their caravan trade, the Nabataeans managed to establish good relationships with the populations of the countries accessed by the routes. It's in this very context of open-mindedness and pacifism that Christianity developed along the shores of the Jordan River. Let's not forget that the foundation of Christianity took place in Transjordan. Baptism is a very important sacred mystery in both Catholicism and Christianity. All Christians believe in baptism. The baptism of Jesus Christ likely happened east of the Jordan River, on the eastern bank, which is something that was confirmed by the Gospel and later by modern discoveries. Why did he preach east of the Jordan River? Because this land, which was mostly inhabited by Arabs and Nabataeans, was open-minded and didn't have any ulterior motive. The Jews, who were divided at the time, were indeed less receptive to the message of Jesus than the Nabataeans. The Nabataeans, who spoke Aramaic, the same language as Jesus, were already organized as a community. The writings and numerous installations found in Petra are a testament to the religious customs of the Nabataeans that would be echoed in Christianity. Okay. 
Christian Auger and his team have been searching the sector of the temples in Petra for many years. Today, their work and discoveries allow to better understand how the sanctuaries functioned and how the religious ceremonies were carried out in those times. In many Nabataean sanctuaries, we found halls that were seemingly reserved for banquets and which featured two or three bench seats. We've also found those in many other edifices that aren't believed to be temples. For example, in front or next to large tombs and also, of course, inside of houses. The concept of honouring one's guests with a banquet was very common in Nabatea. This aspect struck many ancient writers, as the rare few texts that we've uncovered on the subject mention these customs. The celebration of banquets, and in particular banquets for 12 guests of the king, is highlighted. During the meal, a cup of wine would be passed from guest to guest following a Greek custom. These Greco-Bedouin banquets clearly evoke the Last Supper of Christ. Much like the Christians, the Nabataeans believed in the virginal birth of their deities. The master of the pantheon was Dushara, named after the mountain range that culminates east of Petra. As the protector of the royal dynasty, he was the equivalent of Zeus, the god of sky and thunder, and transliterated as Duceres. In Petra, he was worshipped in the great temple of the Lower Temenos, nowadays called Casa Al-Bint. His female consort, Al-Usa, who presided over the fertility of the land, assimilated with the Egyptian and Greek goddesses Isis and Aphrodite. Originally, the Nabataean gods were materialized by sacred stones called baitili. These stones, which were either independent blocks or cut from rocks inside a niche, weren't meant to represent the gods, but rather to notify of their presence. The origin of this stone is attributed to a biblical episode in which Jacob received an auspicious stone from Yahweh that was actually a meteorite and interpreted it as a gate to the heavens and divinity. What is particularly interesting in the case of the Nabataeans is that we have a juxtaposition of non-figurative betelai. And much more elaborate representations that extend to the classic Greco Roman figuration. This bust of Duceres is a good example of this type of anthropomorphic representation of Western influence that's far removed from the original Bytilus, which was a raw black stone. The image of the upright stone, which was prevalent in the Oriental religions of antiquity, was also reinterpreted by Christianity. According to St. Paul, the rock from which water sprang to quench the Hebrews' thirst during the Exodus was a symbol of Christ. The use of the Baitilus was also perpetuated through the Muslim religion, with the black stone of the Kaaba in Mecca, towards which the faithful turned to pray. The birth of Islam, initiated by Muhammad in the seventh century of the Christian era, rekindled the issue of divine representation the scope of which remains current today. Faith in the magical power of icons explains the reticence found in Islam, which forbids men to personify Allah or to reproduce any likeness of his prophet. Given that holy images are banned by the Quran, 
the Muslim and Western worlds are now convinced that the Islamic religion forbids, in theory, any human representation. In reality, the Quran mentions absolutely nothing to support this idea. One also shouldn't forget the astonishing discovery made in Jordan in the 19th century and which dramatically called into question the place of imagery in Islamic art. Located approximately 60 miles east of Amman, in the heart of the steppe, Qasa Amra, or Small Red Castle, is an ancient hammam. Built in the 8th century by a Umayyad prince, the interior of this monument immediately astounds the visitors. in Islam, specifically in the Quran, there is nothing against figural representation. There are some hadiths or sayings attributed to the uh, Prophet uh, which condemn painters and paintings, or those who fashion or who make forms. Uh, but there is nothing as concise or as precise as the commandment in Genesis, thou shalt not make unto thee an image. Maybe among the more strict theologians, there had been an attitude, but not a doctrine, but rather an attitude against the figural representations. And Amra and his fresco paintings, including some uh, nude figures, bathing scenes, uh, hunting, and these are replete with uh, figural representations. And uh, even some uh, of the paintings, like the semi-nude figures which we uh, see behind us, are uh, not consonant with uh, Islamic uh, precepts. Therefore, human representation constitutes a substantial part of the early Islamic art, notably because of the vitality of the local pre-Islamic cultures that were Hellenized and then Romanized. By adopting a hostile perspective towards figurative paintings in the 9th century, the Hadith, or reports of statements and actions of the Prophet, led to the development of naturalism. Simultaneously, symbolism was established, and with it, the school of calligraphy, the art of designing beautiful lettering to exalt the word of God and create the illusion of imagery without inducing any contemplation. <laughs> With the appearance of writing, Arabic, which had only been oral until then, became the official language. From then on, the Islamic world united, integrating a great number of populations and customs, including the Bedouins, who would in turn perpetuate the Islamic traditions. The Bedouin society preserved and protected these traditions better than other societies that were more modern, such as in the cities, for example. The reason is twofold. First, the urban society was more prone to change, while the Bedouins in the desert managed to uphold their values and customs that were devoid of any contact with other civilizations. Second, since they were isolated from outside influence, the Bedouins maintained their values through the immutable gestures of everyday life. The Bedouin society was impervious to the values that the outside world tried to impose.
The Bedouins are committed to preserving the customs of traditional marriage, notably the ceremony of the henna and the numerous festive nights to the rhythm of folk songs. On the other hand, the reading of Al-Fatiha to seal the union of the bride and groom falls within Islamic culture. In certain Bedouin tribes, marriage remains the responsibility of the head of the family. When you're a boy and you get to age 25, you have to get married and leave your birth home. Personally, I went up to the mountains. I traveled to every peak and looked at a lot of girls in search of the right one until I saw one that was sweet and pretty. As she was herding her goats, I wanted to talk to her on several occasions, but I was shy and I didn't dare to walk up to her. After that, I went to see my father to tell him I had found the girl I wanted to marry. My father said no and recommended I stay away from her. So what did I do? I went to see my mother and asked her to talk to my father in order to convince him to agree. That's what my mother did. And after that, everything fell into place. We got married and moved into our own house. We take walks together. We have a sweet and happy life. The goat herding girl and I. While Shaher has chosen to continue to live traditionally, a majority of Bedouins opt for an urban lifestyle. This trend pertains to the cultural unity of the country. All of this contributes to creating a positive image of the Jordanian society that's open to fraternity and solidarity. The best example is the cohabitation with the Palestinian immigrants since the events of 1948. Had Jordan rejected this good neighbor policy along with its Arab roots and the traditions of Islamic Brotherhood, it wouldn't have accepted these immigrants. They're considered as brothers by the Jordanians, who welcome them wholeheartedly. It's a beautiful example of the Arab unity displayed by the Jordanians, who are generally admired by their counterparts. Now almost exclusively Arab, nearly 50% of the Jordanian society is indeed made up of Palestinians. Um. The other half comprises native Transjordanians and a variety of immigrants from the Arab world. Okay, can I have the Okay, this is the As a result of the will to combine these various identities, National unity is notably achieved through cultural and artistic creation. The Performing Arts Center embodies this political ambition. Stemming from the various communities that make up the Jordanian society, these young dancers gather every year to prepare and represent the colors of the kingdom at several international festivals. This policy, initiated by King Hussein in the 1960s, aims to export a dynamic, creative, and cosmopolitan image of Jordan. reputation of the Hashemite kingdom as a safe haven dates back to the 19th century. In 1859, and following the conquest of the Caucasus by the Russian Empire, the Circassians of Muslim faith settled in Jordan. With 20,000 people, they now represent the main ethnic minority in the country. 
remarkably welcoming, Jordan also turned out to be respectful of all other religious confessions. The country, which is 90% Sunni Muslim, also comprises a minority of Druses, as well as a significant Christian community, one third of which is Greek Orthodox, and which represents 8% of the population. It certainly is, like the United States is a melting pot, so is Jordan society. We have people uh, from all over the Middle East. We've had many hundreds of thousands of our own people, Jordanians, who left this country and went to the Gulf to work in neighboring states where the oil boom was taking place. So we did have influxes in and out. That has changed society. Uh, you know, we've been through how many wars? The 1948 war, the 1967 war, the first Gulf War, the war between Iraq and Iran before that, and the second Gulf War. These have changed the face of Jordan somehow. We are still in a state of flux. We're still looking for an identity. It's not easy. Whatever is happening in the region is not letting us be settled. There might still be some changes in the region. Saudi Arabia might not be what it is today. Syria, likewise. Egypt, likewise. We don't know what is going to happen to the west of us, whether there be a Palestinian state, whether there be peace, what kind of population shifts there will be, and we don't know what between the United States and Europe. I think the whole world is not settled yet. Nowadays, the ruler of the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan is Abdullah II, the son of King Hussein. Stemming from the rich trading tribe of the Quraysh that dominated Mecca in the 7th century, the Hashemites are direct descendants of the grandfather of Muhammad, Hashim. The Hashemite dynasty made its mark on the international political scene in 1916, led by Sharif Hussein bin Ali, who sided with the British forces in the great Arab revolt against the Ottomans. After the fall of the Ottoman Empire, Lawrence of Arabia was proclaimed a hero, and Hussein bin Ali recognized as the father of the Arab Revolution. In 1923, his son Abdullah I, then Emir of Transjordan under British mandate, was put in charge of a territory. At the end of the Second World War, and as a reward for his devotion to the Allies, he ascended to the throne of the now independent Kingdom of Jordan, on May the 25th, 1946. But in 1948, the Arab-Israeli conflict forced him into a double-edged strategy. By annexing Cisjordan and dividing up Palestine, he incurred the wrath of the Arab countries and ended up being assassinated in Jerusalem in 1951. After a brief reign by Talal, his son Hussein, considered the real successor of Abdullah I, was crowned King of Jordan in 1953, although he was only 18. The sovereign then took on a double challenge, to regain the trust of the inter-Arab forces while getting in the good graces of the United States that were in favor of peace with Israel. Hussein achieved his goals by relying on the Bedouin tribal forces. The Hashemite dynasty came out reinforced by this singular fight. In less than 80 years, it was able to transform an artificially created state into a real nation. This is how the Bedouin tribes have continued to represent a breeding ground for national identity to this day. Their values have become havens, their traditions bearings, and their devotion to a proud and independent Arabism the spearhead of the Hashemite kingdom.
والهان بك ذايب والبعد جنني Three common features about Jordanians, I'm not excluding other people from those traits, but they believe in dignity, human dignity. To them, it's the most important thing. It is way above economic and financial and other considerations. Second trait, I would say, generosity and hospitality. Jordanians are very generous and hospitable people, especially in their homes. You walk in as a guest, and there's not one thing that you want from a, in a home that they would not give you or offer you. And they are conservative. They believe in fate, or it's actually wondrous how people give in to whatever they believe that fate is given them, they will accept it, regardless of how harsh it is. Jordanians, generally speaking, do believe uh, in fate, in destiny. Having been able to preserve its identity, unity and independence, Today, Jordan continues to commit to peace in the Middle East while striving to build a strong economy. As a result, several free trade agreements with the US were recently signed, opening the door to a future that's made in USA. The question of culture is very important. We strongly Arab, we strongly religious. Islam has a very big influence on our people. The West, many countries in Europe, if not all of them, and certainly the United States, look at us as a model, as a bridge, if you like, between fundamentalist Islam, extremist religious guys, and the West, where there are freedoms, individual and collective freedoms, where there is democracy and pluralism. We're not perfect, but We've started on that road. So they look at us as a possible model. Jordan's vocation is first and foremost to be a country that's open-minded towards all civilizations, and also towards all confessions, should they be Islamic or Christian. As I mentioned earlier, this open-mindedness is the reason why Jordan is such a great place to live. Over 2,500 years of history separate the Hashemites from the Nabataeans. To speak of the two peoples in terms of filiation would surely be a stretch. However, while time has eroded the rock, it hasn't erased the fortitude of those who've been living on this land, generation after generation. It is as if each stroke of the burin cutting through the Petra stone still resonates in the heart of all Jordanians, engraving the crease of its identity into their memory.